Our numbers are still going up, so we're going to give them just another couple minutes and then we will start. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started so that um, we can get some preliminaries out of the way. Uh, we are very appreciative that you're taking time out of your very busy schedule, especially during a December post-election to uh, participate. Uh, we wanted to let you know that this is being recorded and we do post them on the NeoMed website, uh, Coordinating Center of Excellence website after they're done so that you'll be able to uh, watch it later or share it with others. And to those that couldn't attend that had signed up, we will be able to share it with them. So I wanted to give a very special thanks to the Coordinating Center of Excellence and particularly the Ashley Eads, who helps us with all the mechanics and putting it together and mailing it out and et cetera. This is actually the fourth in a series, the Attorney General Task Force that I co-chair with for eight years, Mike DeWine, and now going starting my fifth year uh, next year with uh, Attorney General Yost is, um, has a committee called uh, Treatment and Best Practice. <laughs> Sorry. Did not forget I had not turned that off. So anyhow, um, we are putting on four trainings aimed at jail personnel, people who are treatment personnel, who people who support the persons in jail, just trying to educate them. And this kind of came out of uh, a survey we did where we realized that nobody really understood psychotropic drugs and especially long-term injectables, nor did they understand that they were all reimbursable by the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services under a, an allocation from the state. And so we thought we would need to educate them because this is free money. And if your county is not getting reimbursement for that, psychotropic drugs, long-term injectables, and MAT, you are losing out on an opportunity that you could be reimbursed for. Uh, we have a, some, about four or five counties that have never asked for the money. So we're trying to get that word out. So we did the first one trying to explain those uh, what, the, what they are, how they work, just basic uh, uh, 101. Then we did a second one on what mental illness in jails looks like, what it manifests as, how you distinguish it from addiction issues and overdoses and other things. And then we started a series that we're on now called Collaboration for Mental Health Care for the Incarcerated. And in this particular series, we are uh, focusing on how you can work together the jails and the mental health community, the hospitals, the providers to coordinate your care and get everybody really involved. The first one featured Cuyahoga and the Cleveland, Cleveland Hospital. It was an amazing uh, process. So the second one is featuring one of my favorites, Chief Jeff Stobart and the Franklin County Jail. And I wanted to settle the stage a little bit for that one because Stepping Up is a project that focuses on persons with jail in and who have mental illness. And it started almost 12 years ago when some sheriffs, the National Sheriff's Association went to the National County Commissioners Association and said, we're basically the de facto hospital. We don't have budget training staff. We should not be. We should not be uh, where they end up. They should end, be in the mental health system. And so they put together a program called Stepping Up where each county could sign up. The county commissioners had to agree to sign up and join. and um, see if they could make any difference. Well, they picked six counties in the country to try this out as a model first, and Franklin County was one of the six. Uh, so they had a team come in for several years, actually. I worked with them toward the end of the time after I left the bench and got involved with uh, the Franklin County project. And Chief Stobart was there from the very beginning working with us on that. That success completed. Then we went on to pick three states, uh, Council for State Governments who ran the program, picked three states, Ohio, Texas, and California. 
And we were very, very uh, blessed to have a Peg's Foundation out of Hudson, Ohio, uh, fund a lot of the work. So we always tell people we're not from the government. We're a private, privately funded effort, but we have 58 counties that have now signed up. And we have a steering committee at the state level of 53 members, all the associations, the sheriffs, hospitals, uh, halfway houses, all the major state agencies. And we work on problems we find out about at the local level at, and try to find solutions at the state level. And then we use the attorney general task force as sort of our action arm with its 15 committees. So there's a lot of moving parts in here, but this particular session is going to focus on the building of a new jail because an outgrowth, well, this process had started long ago to try to put a new jail together. But when Franklin County became involved with stepping up, there were a lot of things that uh, they changed that they credit to stepping up, which makes me very, very excited and pleased about and makes like our work feel worthwhile. But uh, that's why we decided there's just so much that we wanted to focus just this whole session on the things they've done that I think a lot of people on this phone call, a lot of jails can maybe not build a brand new jail like Franklin County, but they can adopt some of the practices and proce procedures that they've incorporated. And so that's why we wanted to feature this uh, solely to see uh, ideas that you might be able to use. So Chief Deputy Jeff Stobert was is the Chief Deputy of Research Development and major projects in the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. And when I first got to know him, he was managing the jail. He's got 30 years of experience in this and he's managed the security for over 2000 inmates in the two jails. And now they're, come, they're building this brand new one, which I hope will consolidate his operations. He obtained a graduate certificate in management development from Cornell University and is a graduate of North Western University School of Police, Staff, and Command. He's on the Franklin County Reentry Committee, the Franklin County Justice Planning Board, the National Sheriff's Association and Detention Committee, and the Advisory Board for the National Sheriff's Association Center for Jail Operations. That's his formal bio. His informal bio is, I love the guy. He is a doer. He is an action-oriented person. He really, really cares about the people that are in his custody at his jail. I took the jail tour and I was just blown away by all the innovative things that really try to focus on instead of treating them like a bad person and, a, and an inmate, treating them like a human being with some dignity and trying to help reverse the cycle that got them into that jail. So we're really proud of them. And Major Chad Thompson has worked with them. And Melissa Pearson uh, is, I think, going to present a little bit as well. They're all part of that team that have been wonderful to work with. And we're so proud to work with them and to be able to feature their program. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the good chief to talk about his brand new jail and what he's doing. Uh, thank you, Justice. That was too much. <laughs> I, I do appreciate it. Um, obviously, Franklin County has been working on this project for, for quite some time. And as Justice Stratton stated, this, this really started for us with the Stepping Up initiative. Uh, when I originally became the Chief of Corrections, um, we very quickly recognized that um, we were running the largest mental health hospital in the state of Ohio. The... We were struggling with that. Um, we have two very old, very antiquated jails. Um, we reached out for some help from the Council of State Governments and um, all of the, the right pieces kind of fell into place. They were looking to for some counties to pilot the Stepping Up Initiative and basically came into Franklin County, uh, did a deep dive into the data here in Franklin County, uh, not just jail data, uh, data from our Adam H board, from our board of commissioners, funding sources, the courts. And they came back with a list of recommendations for Franklin County, um, all of which we have graciously and, and willingly uh, implemented here in Franklin County. Um, the, the major lift here in Franklin County was obviously that we were not housing folks who were suffering from mental illness, who were cycling through the doors of our jail, not only with mental illness, but co-occurring drug and alcohol issues in a way that we should be. I think most of the folks on this call 
clearly recognize that locking somebody who's mentally ill behind a solid steel door for 22, 23 hours a day does nothing for them but further decompensate them. And unfortunately, due to our, the physical plant of our jail, we really didn't have very many options. Um, so one of the recommendations that came back was either a renovation or a total rehaul of our jails. Um, blessed here in Franklin County that we have an incredibly strong um, criminal justice planning board and it, led by um, the Office of Justice Policy and Programs. And you'll hear from Melissa Pearson a little later in the presentation, who's been really my partner uh, throughout this process as far as building this. Um, the commissioners have 100 percent um, bought into this process and the criminal justice planning board here in franklin county played a huge part of of that uh, the criminal justice planning board has representatives from every piece of the criminal justice system uh, the decision makers the doers for all of those organizations are involved in that process and it's led by uh, the commissioners ojpp um, because of that, everybody was kind of rowing in the, in, in the same direction, um, which made it fairly easy for us to reimagine this and do something a little bit innovative and outside of what you would see kind of in, in a normal jail setting. Uh, two very old, very antiquated jails, again, that you're seeing pictures on the screen of our old main jail downtown. Um, opened in 1971, very um, linear designed facility, um, old enough now that we can't even find replacement parts to fix some of the things that are going wrong with it. Um, you want to, this is uh, this, what you're seeing is our Jackson Pike facility, a little newer dormitory style housing, but still indirect supervision. Um, to, we don't have a single post or guard post or deputies post anywhere in either of our two facilities where deputies can actually physically see the inmates. There's little to very little interaction uh, with the inmates to see them. You've got to walk down catwalks or down hallways, look in windows or through bars. And that is certainly not what is considered the best practice in today's uh correctional systems uh, anywhere in the country. So we very early in the process made a, a decision to move to a direct supervision um, and a direct supervision housing unit um, for our new facility. So the entire facility is built as direct supervision. The deputies will be embedded in the housing units with the inmates so that we can have that um, social interaction as we walk through this process. I hope as you walk through this, one of the things that you're going to see is um, some of the innovative things that that we've done to try to normalize the environment. Chad, if you want to move to the next one. Um, there, there's a lot of innovative things that we did to try to create lots of natural light to normalize the environment to make to make it look um, a little bit less stressful and industrial. Um, we've got lots of windows, lots of natural light. We used biophilic design and a lot of the things that you'll hear about kind of as we continue to walk through the design. Um, we very purposefully and meticulously planned this facility in such a way that we were not only doing everything in our power to decrease tension, uh, not only for the inmates who were coming in, but for the staff. As, as most of you know, the folks that are cycling through the doors of our jails, most of the time, you know, they're, they're coming in and it's the worst day of their lives. And I don't know about any of you, but I certainly wouldn't want to be judged on the worst day of my life. And it's a change in operational philosophy for us um, we're using a new philosophy out of the National Institute of Corrections called Strategic Inmate Management. And the premise of that is that you're kind of changing your thinking. 
you're moving to a, a mindset that um, 95% of the folks that cycle through the doors of the facility are going to do exactly what we ask them to do. Um, for the 5 to 10% that, that choose not to do that, that's a choice. And we still have, it's still a jail, we still have places for them. But 95% of the folks that cycle through the doors of the jail are going to do exactly what we ask them to do. So what we wanted to do was to create an environment that was less, um, it wasn't as sterile, it was not as industrial. Um, and as we walk through, you'll see some of the things as Major Thompson kind of walks through this. Um, but we wanted to make sure we not only did things for the folks that were cycling through the door of the jail that were justice involved, but we wanted to also make sure that we were doing things for our staff and the benefits of, of creating an environment in our facilities that was conducive uh, to the justice involved folks that were coming through is also really good for our staff. <laughs> you know, putting a bunch of windows in our staff's office is a good thing. Um, natural light is a good thing in a facility like this. Um, you'll notice that, you know, we have open seating in our, our booking area um, that looks like a airport kind of waiting, uh, waiting room um, at a gate. Um, th those things were done to, again, to to decrease tension and to try to help um, inmates decrease stress, decrease tension so that we can get good information from them. They're more willing to share with us their risks and needs uh, so that we can better address them uh, as they're coming through and cycling through our process. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to, to Major Thompson, who is going to walk through some of the design features, obviously including um, our mental health spaces uh, that we have designed to be step-down units, as well as um, one of the, we think, one of the nicest and best um, spaces for medically managed withdrawal within a within the facility. We have created a medically managed withdrawal pod uh, so that we're able to um, better manage those folks that are cycling through the doors of the jail. As we all know, nobody on this call needs to be told Ohio's kind of ground zero of the opioid epidemic and the folks that are cycling through the doors of the jail that are suffering from mental illness um, not only are suffering from mental illness, but many of them are self-medicating um, using drugs or alcohol. So we wanted to create a space where we could manage that withdrawal because those are the most at-risk folks that are coming through the doors of our facility. So with that, uh, Major Thompson, I'll turn it over to you. Major Thompson is the major uh, that is in charge of um, my research and development unit here and has played an integral part in this facility, the design of this facility, and really has been kind of, my, if Melissa's my right hand, he's been, she, he's been my left hand um, through this process. So Chad, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Uh, so yeah, I, I was uh, brought on board. I was actually the facility commander of our uh, downtown facility uh, when this project started and was moved over to uh, research and development uh, specifically uh, to do this. So when we started looking at, uh, you know, our facility and, and, you know, kind of what best practices were, you know, we realized that, uh, you know, the design of the building, uh, our current, our legacy buildings had a very direct effect uh, on both those who were incarcerated and really our, our staff. And you can see on your screen, you know, kind of list of, of words that describe both uh, legacy facilities, a lot of people's legacy facilities, and then where you're trying to go, right? What, what, what were you trying to uh, accomplish? And, and, you know, we, we went through that list and we said, okay, 
we're going to create uh, a design, a building design that definitely uh, provides uh, a dignified uh, space. Uh, we're going to try and more normalize our environment, right? Uh, because I, just as the chief said, the vast majority, 90, 95% of the people uh, in your jail, no matter what their, their, their criminal history or their current charges, they're going to do what you ask them to do. And we realized that in our legacy facilities, we were, we were treating everybody as if they were Hannibal Lecter. We were treating them all as if they were that 5% that just won't com you know, be compliant. And, and we wanted to switch that around, right? We wanted to create uh, an environment where they felt protected uh, that was as therapeutic as you're going to get uh, in, a, in a county jail setting. Um, we did at several times in our design meetings have to say, hey, don't forget we're building a jail. Um, still has its primary purpose, but we're gonna change what, uh, what that delivery method to that purpose looks like. <clears throat> Things we realized uh, where uh, jails, modern jails were, where they were going, you know, uh, counties all over the United States, ours included, are focusing on diversion. But diversion sometimes happens with incarcerated people. Sometimes that diversion starts while they're incarcerated and you're really diverting perhaps the next visit, right? Uh, courts are working on alternative sentencing. Very, very serious uh, concentration on mental health, uh, which to do the diversion, the alternative sentencing and mental health, you have to form those collaborative partnerships uh, out in your communities, right? We wanted a holistic approach uh, starting, you walk, you know, you pull into our Sally Port. Our Sally Port uh, has windows in it. They're high, they're up high, but we have windows. We're, le we're letting daylight in. Uh, so we're starting uh, our, our feel uh, just as you pull into the, basically the garage, right? And then that continues as you go through the building with the, not only the design, but the services that are uh, afforded uh, those people uh, who've been incarcerated. So the programming, continuum of care. Uh, and Melissa will talk about, Melissa, uh, our Office of Justice Policies and Programs and their Rapid Resource Center uh, provides uh, uh, an incredible piece of that continuum of care for those people once they're released. And then we have to be focused on outcome. Uh, you know, we have to be focused on, on are, are we making a difference, right? And so we looked at our environment and we said, you know, definitely it creates boundaries. You know, there are walls, but when you look at our legacy facilities, there's the walls of the jail, and then there's the bars and the solid doors everywhere uh, that create a lot of boundaries uh, between the incarcerated person and our staff and limits that interaction and and other services that may be provided right uh, the environment can regulate behavioral response uh, I like you know I, I would liken it to um, you know if you put people essentially in a cage they're going to act like they're in a cage uh, and, and that behavioral, that, that base response is, is a real thing as I'm sure most of you are aware. And then we needed to be able to foster some trust with our staff, right? If, if we're going to try and help and we're going to try and provide all of these services and do these things, our building, our physical plant needed to not fight us with trying to build that trust that they believe we are actually trying to help. <clears throat> we could not have done it without the National Institute of Corrections. Um, and this is our, our shameless plug for them. If you don't interact with the National Institute of Corrections and you're, you know, a, a, a jail, if you're part of a jail or a prison, um, I highly encourage you uh, to contact them. Uh, they are probably the one entity in the government that when they show up and say, we're here to help, uh, that is their job. They, they want to help. Their mission is to help jails and prisons 
be better. So I, they, they provided us with so much uh, help and information and, and mentoring. Um, can't say enough about them. So one of the things that we had to concentrate on very early and learn is that repetition does not establish validity. Just because we've always done it that way doesn't make it valid. Uh, and so uh, we really paid attention to when we looked at, uh, you know, our policies, our procedures, uh, you know, different pieces, we said, why? Why do we do that? Is it a best practice? If we think it is, why is it? Um, and, you know, we told this chief and, and I told our team members day one, uh, if your only reason for why we should continue something is because that's the way we've always done it. We're going to get rid of you. We don't need you. Right. So repetition does not establish validity. And it's, it's hard. It, uh, uh, I had them point back at me in a couple of meetings early on because it's hard to get over that hump. Right. So we decided we needed our goals. What are we what are our goals? We wanted to adopt a new overall inmate behavior management system. Uh, our linear design was basically afforded us almost a, a zero behavior management system. You know, we let the walls and the doors do it. Um, we wanted to improve those opportunities by going to direct supervision. We wanted to build a building or design a building that supported our new operation, but was flexible and could adapt to other uh, oper operational uh, systems, right? Our current buildings, our legacy buildings, don't afford us the opportunity to do anything other than warehouse people. Uh, we wanted to in uh, increase our inmate programming opportunities, uh, provide a, a, a more comprehensive continuum of mental health care, and we wanted to provide for our staff. Um, we would we would use the the story you know you can open up Forbes magazine once or twice a year and see the 50 best companies to work for, and we'd say why are they the 50 one of the 50 best? It's not their widget, it's not their product because you know we know that's good that's why they're successful. They're one of those companies they make the magazine on how they treat their people, right? And so. We looked for every opportunity we could to incorporate that idea uh, and say, how do we get on that list? If there was a list of the 50 best jails in the country to work for, how do we not only get on that list, but top that list? So to do that, we had to learn things like a more normative environment. Um, the chief and I both had probably 20, somewhere between 23 and 25 years a piece uh, working for the sheriff's office. Everybody in our office uh, starts in the jail and then often when you get promoted, you go back to the jail. That's where the, the vacancies are. Uh, and so we both spent quite a bit of time working in corrections through our years. Yeah, our, our legacy building was our normal at you know when we started this and we knew we had to we had to figure out what a more normative environment means right doing away with that typical environment of monotony uh, our legacy buildings uh, are monotonous they are uh, very purpose built had to get away from that people in a normal environment have control over their lives, have control over the different things they do every day. Well, it's a jail. We had to, you know, still be a jail, but there are things that we could do, and we'll, we'll show you some of them, that give them some opportunity to have that control back, and it's okay. It could be as simple as doing your own laundry. We have washers and dryers going going into our housing units. Uh, and, you know, when people look at me all sideways, and if you work in a jail, especially a legacy old building, we had uh, a lot of our big problems where they were cutting up our sheets 
and hanging uh, clotheslines and drying their clothes uh, all over this, all over the cell. We hated it. Get down clotheslines. They block your view. When we stepped back and we said, all right, people in jails do things because we're not meeting a need. And the need was, well, we do their laundry, but we did it once a week on schedule, no problem. We'll wash your underwear for you, wash your socks, give them to us once a week. If you only have two or three pair of underwear, you're not going to want to wait that extra three or four or five days, depending on the rotation. And so they're washing them in the sink. And we said, you know what? We'll still have a schedule for using those washers and dryers, but that's an aspect of their lives that we can at least give them some level of control back in a dignified way, right? And we said our building must support our operational goals, right? The building has to support it. Cannot We can no longer continue to have a physical space that fights what we're trying to do. Biophilic design. The, the, the chief likes to say he's a crusty old uh, jail commander who, you know, never in a million years thought he would have to learn and then use the words biophilic design. I'm not quite as old and crusty, but I'm right with him, right? And as we learn, it's, as you see, approach to architecture that seeks to connect the building occupants more closely to nature. It happens uh, sometimes very subtly, wood grains, some texture, maybe colors. Um, sometimes, as you see there, that, that big uh, picture over top of our deputy's workstation, um, that's a mural. It's a, it's a, if you know what a fathead is, it's a very, very, very high resolution picture printed on a vinyl that then gets put up on the wall. Um, and we'll show you some more here. <clears throat> so that mural you saw is pretty standard for our general population units. They start about nine and a half foot above the ground. They are nine foot tall by 46 feet wide in total, right? And we have murals in every single housing unit. So this is a picture of one of our maximum medium security uh, housing units before the mural went up. Here's different angle. Here's with the mural, and that, and it's a it's a simple, actually a fairly low cost uh, compared to building a new jail. But if you're trying to brighten space, if you're trying to bring some of that in, you know, it's hard to add windows to your existing building to brighten up a space. Um, but murals are are one of the more I'll say cost effective. It's not that they're cheap, um, but more attainable ways. <clears throat> so acute mental health, um, it's a space where uh, they are single cells. It is for the most decompensated, uh, those people that uh, it's just not safe. They are not med compliant and it's just not safe to have them in a, a more general population setting. Our design is set up to uh, have 12 single cells basically in a horseshoe around the deputy's workstation. Um, but those are also facing another set of cells. And so as you become med compliant, we'll move you over to this other section that you can see, they can see each other. And we'll let you out with other people. We'll uh, start giving you more privileges, more things. And we want those people who are the most decompensated to see people being moved over and getting more uh, uh, privileges. And we want them to want to want to move, right? We're trying to give them some sort of a, uh, an incentive. But as you see, this looks fairly sterile, right? It, it, but when we put up a very simple, it's a, probably about a three foot tall, two and a half to three foot tall border of clouds, you can see the difference in uh, just the look feel. Uh, it is, it is, 
uh, when they put these up, uh, these were one of the first ones to go up. And I walked in and was shocked. I knew it would be good. I was shocked at how much it changed the feeling of this space, right? <clears throat> Just above uh, the window here, the, the front window you see in the ceiling, you see these white lines up in the, that's actually a skylight. So this housing unit is on the second floor. Um, and because of where it's positioned in the building, didn't have a lot of opportunities for windows. Um, so pretty much every place on the second floor of our facility, um, we put skylights. Even if they had a lot of windows, we put them in, trying to bring as much of that natural light in as possible. These are a couple of other views uh, of that space, right? So it, on the left-hand side, is I'm kind of looking down and there's a hallway between the two sections or two sides of our mental health unit. The right hand picture, I'm actually standing inside of one of our sub day rooms looking at another mural. So that is that that uh, beach scene, that pier going out um, is actually a big mural on a wall and you can see it on the left-hand side looking down that hallway, right? Beautiful. It is an absolutely beautiful picture. Absolutely uh, uh, gives a lot of uh, opportunity for people to see something other than a sterile, uh, well, either sterile white or everybody's favorite, like correctional beige <laughs> color. We, want, we just want to give them something to, to look at, right? So this is our MAT uh, or detox uh, housing unit. There is a center wall running down the middle that allows us the opportunity to separate at least some of our violent people who are charged with violent crimes or people who are charged with nonviolent crimes. Um, but it's all open. It is an open bay. Uh, there are four person four person sleeping areas. Uh, we did space those bunks a little wider apart to allow for uh, wheelchairs and or uh, a gurney. Um, based on the, the population we knew would be going into this space. In the common area that you see on the left, we positioned our, our furniture, uh, our, our tables that we were bolting to the floor we positioned those pieces in such a way that we could take those movable chairs and actually create almost neighborhoods, almost little gathering places where they could hold two or three small group sessions right there on each side of that center wall uh, out in the open. There are uh, meeting rooms like a small counseling, like a one-on-one, -on -one, two-on-one counseling room in every housing unit. We also put medical exam rooms in every housing unit. We wanted to have as many of the services be able to come into the housing unit and be as available as possible um, to those people who were incarcerated. So there's actually a medical exam room also situated in this and every one of our housing units. So biophilic design, when, uh, so this is a picture of an atrium that is in our, what we're calling reception. It is our booking intake. Uh, when the chief was talking earlier about the airport type seating, uh, this is it. And it, those seats look out into the atrium. Uh, when our architect first suggested it, we said no. Uh, and then through several discussions, uh, we agreed to go visit a jail that had an atrium. And it took about eight seconds when we walked into their reception area, their booking area, and saw the amount of daylight and saw the, the effect that that had just on the look feel of the space. Um, it was incredible. And we said, okay, 
uh, let's talk about an atrium. But one of the things that it did was it put a window in our staff's office, right? And I'd say if you've ever had an office without a window, then you get an office with a window, you know how much that matters. Well, this is, this is our staff's office. The people who work in this area work in this area every single day. Uh, and so as much as it, is, it was designed to help alleviate the stress being felt by the, the people who were being brought to us, uh, it very much was uh, there to help the stress levels and the feeling of our staff. And so this it completely changed our booking area. As much as we're proud of our first phase, our county is building this project in three phases. Uh, the first phase gives us 864 beds. Um, most of them are our specialty beds, our medical, mental health, our disciplinary type beds. Um, our first phase and our second phase, which is actually under construction, second phase adds 418 more beds focused primarily on women. Um, one of the things we noticed in our travels and, and research was women, unless it was a women's only facility, women in county jails were almost an afterthought, you know. Uh, back in the day, women didn't really come to jail. Well, unfortunately, we're seeing more and more. And we said, you know, we need to be able to provide all of the services and all of the things. We have a rendering. So this is a look at what our second phase female housing will generally look like once we're done. You'll notice the, the wood grain that runs up the wall and across the ceiling. Those are acoustic panels. They just have a wood grain uh, look to the outside of them. Uh, and we really tried to bring more of those pieces of nature into the environment, um, into the internal environment. The big green wall in the back, that was, our architects tried to convince us to put in a living wall. And we said, no, we're, we're not doing that. that there's, a, there's a lot of other things that come with that, the maintenance and care and, um, so we did some different that we're not going to have a living wall, but the daylight, the skylights, the, the, this whole more normalized environment, this looks, when you first look at it, if you didn't tell you it was a jail, you might think it's a common area in some small college, uh, uh, you know, social building. We are going to have a, uh, a higher level of classification of female uh, females where we would have to bolt those those tables down and and have it be a little closer to what you would think of as a jail but it's still with the colors the wood um, we're trying to bring in the daylight we're trying to bring still as much of that that feel in as possible <clears throat> when we talked about our staff we said you know we got to build something that is really them for them. And what we were able to do was in our staff dining area, uh, we were able to give them a, a nice, big, open, comfortable space, but it also goes to an outdoor courtyard. It's all still inside the secure perimeter of the building, um, but this is a staff only space. They can go outside and get air. They can go outside and enjoy the sun when, when it's nice. Uh, and, and so we really wanted to show them in, in as many ways as we could, um, that we value them, uh, not going to bore you with all of the pictures. We, we put in a very nice, very state of the art, uh, wellness center, a gym. Um, it's about 2,500 square feet and is loaded with, uh, uh, loaded with all of the best equipment. Uh, we also provided really nice locker rooms and shower facilities and, and co-located those, or how about uh, 
co uh, located those adjacent to the wellness center and we're making that wellness center and the locker room facilities available to anybody that works in the sheriff's office so uh, we really really tried to do what we could in a jail for our staff so chief So I, I think one of the kind of the next piece of this is, um, especially when you're talking about those folks that are suffering from mental illness or the folks that are dealing with drug and alcohol issues, the folks that are part of our medication assisted treatment programs where they're receiving the long lasting injectables that, that Justice Stratton talked about, um, you know, we needed to create kind of that continuity of care to the community. And we've done that currently in our current facilities with a, a thing called a, a rapid resource center that is actually attached to the lobby of one of our facilities. But as we moved into this facility, we wanted to kind of take things to the next level. Um, so with that, the rapid resource center is actually run by our office of justice policy and programs and my good friend, uh, Melissa Pearson. Um, so I'm going to kick it to Melissa and let her kind of talk about and explain the Rapid Resource Center, which is going to be located basically directly off of our releasing lobby. So as we release folks from the facility, um, they're basically going to have to go th by or through the Rapid Resource Center, kind of like Disney Q, um, where you have to go through the gift shop um, to get connected to those resources in the community. So with that, Melissa, it's all yours. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Chief. And if you could real quickly tell me what our timeline looks like. I wasn't sure if this was to go to one o'clock or a little later. I believe we have till about one fifteen. A little bit of okay. time for questions afterwards is what the, they told us. Perfect. Well, I'm going to use that time wisely. I want to start just by saying thank you. Thank you to Justice Stratton, who has absolutely been the state of Ohio's biggest cheerleader. She is known throughout the country, and I just, I don't know where we'd be without her. I also want to thank Neomed for sponsoring this. And I can't uh, say thank you enough times to my 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 brothers over there, Chief Stobart and Major Thompson, um, to see what they've done. Every time I watch this presentation, I'm just really kind of beside myself um, because of the attention to detail that has gone into this new facility. I don't think you could ever understand unless you're knee deep into the planning of it. We've gotten a little taste of it ourselves because we're building a rapid resource center off of the new jail space. And Boy, I always thought maybe building a home would be fun, but uh, it's tedious. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it. So I really applaud them. And I, I applaud this new approach to uh, community and local corrections, because I think it's it's going to yield some, some big changes that we'll be studying very, very closely. So as Chief Stobart said, we, um, we knew that a lot of the individuals coming into our jail um, we wanted them to come out and imagine this, I could give you a really long mission statement, but what I challenge my staff and what I say to myself is two things. Is it possible that individuals can go into our jail and come out better? Is that so hard to believe? I don't think it is. Is it possible that people can go into our jail and be healthier tomorrow because of that experience than they are today? These are lofty goals. I'm not naive but I think they're doable goals. And one thing that we also realize is that most individuals, and, I'm, and this is probably across the country, they get in and out of our jails so quickly. It's very, very difficult to wrap around them in any way, shape form, or form, or really do any intensive type of in-reach services. So the purpose of the Rapid Resource Center was, was, was for a couple of reasons. One, we were not having success being able to do in-reach with the 19,000 individuals that are booked into our jail in uh, uh, each year. Very, very, very hard uh, task to do. Secondly, and this is a big deal to us, um, as, as Chief Stobart met, mentioned, Ohio is kind of ground zero for uh, the fentanyl crisis and the opioid overdose crisis. So we knew that by individuals, 70% of individuals getting out within three days 
we were doing very little to reduce the chances that these individuals would come out, potentially return to old neighborhoods, old friends, old spaces, and not be at greater risk for an overdose and potential death. And I'm gonna share a stat with you that really kind of drives our work here. We overlaid the coroner's data here in Franklin County with our jail management system. And what we found is that 67% of the individuals that died during 2017, during 2019, and during 2020, we did them each year, 67% of those individuals were known to our jail management, management system. But even more interesting is that between 19 and 23% had been in our jail the 12 months preceding their death. Let me say that statistic again. Between 19 and 23% of individuals that died in any of those three given years were in our jail the 12 months preceding their death. Now, what that screams to me is what an opportunity, what a window we have here to really do and make some change, to get individuals linked to treatment, to provide them with some um, opportunity to understand how to administer naloxone. So the Rapid Resource Center really was about how do we get folks linked to treatment before they leave? How do we reduce the number of opioid related overdose deaths? And how do we ultimately decrease recidivism? Next slide, please, Chad. When we originally came up with the concept of the Rapid Resource Center, we actually titled it Fast Track to Treatment. Love the title, it's catchy and I, and I still reference it. But what we click, quickly realize is that individuals coming out of our jail, and again, they often over 70% leave within 72 hours, they have more needs than just the treatment linkage needs. They have those social determinants of health needs that we're, that we're all talking about. And it's a very real thing. I can't get someone into treatment until I can make sure they've had a sandwich and they have food in their belly. I can't really get someone to understand why it's important to take their meds until I can get them under safe housing. So the Rapid Resource Center quickly escalated into more than just getting folks linked to treatment. It really was taking a look at some of those basic needs that individuals must have before we can consider some of those higher order, order uh, linkage, uh, linkages that we do understand is absolutely critical. So we launched the Rapid Resource Center February 1st of 2021. If any of you uh, out there tried to launch a program in the midst of the pandemic, <clears throat> you share our pain. It was, uh, it was a slow roll, um, largely due to staffing, largely due to the fact that uh, we simply did not have as many people coming into the facility. That's good news. And we didn't have visitors uh, coming into the facility either. So it was a slow opening, which is probably looking back now for the best. But since that February 1st date, we have seen 3,925 ind individuals come through our doors, and that's as of September 30th, so it's even higher now. Every month that we've been opened, the number of attendees coming through our doors has grown. Now, we, we um, are tracking everything. We're very data-driven in, uh, in our county. So I wanted to give you a snapshot. And I know this infograph is a little bit busy and I'm hoping the slides will go out to you guys after, but some of the things that we're looking at are those hard treatment linkages. And what was really important to us is if we're gonna partner with a treatment agency, <clears throat> excuse me, and we call and say, we've got an individual who says he's ready or she's ready for treatment, that means today. That doesn't mean two weeks from today. That means today, we've got to capitalize on that opportunity. And like Jeff said, the Rapid Resource Center really is positioned almost like an exit through the gift shop model. We're going to be there. We're going to be kind of in your face. You kind of have to walk by us or through us. And you might not think you want to talk to us, <clears throat> but there's coffee brewing. There's smiling faces greeting you. And as Justice Stratton mentioned at the very beginning, my staff, is trained and understand that if you can't treat someone with dignity, if you can't welcome someone into the center as if you were really excited to see them, then this isn't the employment for you. I want individuals to feel like we're here and we're here to make your life easier. We're here to make sure these next few days are planned out so that you're at le less, least, less, least amount of risk for going out, overdosing, getting back into those neighborhoods where you really shouldn't probably be, anything we can do to make it easier, especially those first few days. So <clears throat> we're handing out coats, we're handing out naloxone kits, we're handing out bus passes. We now have a transportation option where we can get people 
to a bus stop and we can then give them a bus pass. We have the opportunity to give out ID vouchers and birth certificate vouchers. So that challenge has been removed. We all know it's very hard to seek employment. You don't have a state ID if you don't have a birth certificate. So we're trying to remove any of those challenges that we could possibly identify. We also, um, you, you never want to negate the small things. Kind of forgot that when someone gets booked in and their phone is sitting in a property bag, their phones are usually dead. They're not charged. So we have an industrial size charger that's available. And I'll be honest, that's usually what gets people in the doors. They just need to charge their phone so they can call for a ride. So you can study this slide in more detail when those come out, but I wanted to tell you some of our plans for expansion. Um, we're all dealing with an affordable housing crisis. Um, that's just across the country. And it is especially true here in Franklin County. What we have to all understand is that when a judge submits paperwork that says this, in, this individual is released from jail, that release has to happen. And unfortunately, that means we have a number of individuals that are still being released during those third shift hours when we don't really have a lot of supportive services readily available. So what is going to launch, and I'm really excited to share this with you, uh, this will launch next Wednesday. Uh, we're calling it the Bridge Respite Program. And so if you're an individual that's booked into our jail and at booking, you've indicated homelessness, Upon discharge, we're going to give you the opportunity to go to one of our community providers who also operates a treatment center, but we're going to give you the opportunity to go to what we're considering respite housing. It's not going to solve our housing crisis, but it is going to negate some of that really, really early on risk that we know is there for individuals, especially those who are opioid users, those first few days right out of a jail or carceral setting. So individuals can leave our jail go to a location for three to five nights. <clears throat> I wish it could be longer for three to five nights. And from there, they'll have peer support specialists working with them to think about, well, what is next week going to look like? You're here, you're safe, you're fed. You've got a warm roof over your head. You've got caring, supportive people. You've got access to a telephone. Let's plan out what next week looks like. And oh, by the way, if you're considering treatment, we'll just move your hallway. So this hallway that you're in right now is just for this respite housing. But if you feel like you need treatment, guess what? You don't need to go anywhere. We are under the roof of a treatment provider and it's residential treatment. So that individual can very easily walk down the hallway and boom, they're now in a treatment setting for a good three to six months. The other thing we'll be expanding, we'll be um, embedding a uh, harm reduction vending kit, I'm sorry, vending machine right outside the Rapid Resource Center. Inside this uh, vending machine will be pregnancy tests, um, STD testing kits, Narcan, of course, uh, fentanyl test strips, condoms, feminine hygiene products, all those things that we might take for granted that we can just go to the local CVS and get, maybe not as readily available. And maybe there's a little bit of shame even to going and getting those. These will be available uh, through an anonymous program. No names will be given. Uh, we will be tracking demographics, but no names. And so individuals can, and can seek those products uh, right outside the Rapid Resource Center. I wanna emphasize also that the Rapid Resource Center is also for family members of individuals in jail, family members that might have loved ones or friends, and they too will be able to uh, use that uh, harm reduction vending machine. We just went 24 seven about a month ago. We realized that a good number of our individuals are still released third shift. Why shouldn't they have the benefit of all those services that we're able to provide during first and second shift? Next slide, please. So <clears throat> I kind of told you all of the services that we offer and um, that's phase one, Jackson Pike. That's kind of in the old school uh, current building that we're in. And while nobody wants to think they have to build a new jail, we don't like building a new jail, but we know the reality is we needed a new jail. So um, thank you to the graciousness of our Franklin County Board of Commissioners, the Sheriff's Office, and my entire team. We will have a second Rapid Resource Center built out similar to the jail designs that Major Thompson talked to. Very much a biophilic design, which by the way, I never thought I'd heard, I never thought I'd uh, have the day where Chief Stobart would say the word biophilic design. It's it's just kind of a good fun moment there. Um, but all those touches that really do make a difference, they really do reduce blood pressure, give you a sense of calm that maybe wasn't there before. So the Rapid Resource Center, and we'll show you some renderings uh, next, we'll build in all those nice touches that really are helpful. 
But I want to be very clear to show you that this program was not done just because of our agency and is not successful just because of our program. It's all those agency providers on the side. And unfortunately, some of the names got cut off. But this program, when we built it, we literally had to turn providers away. People were so excited about the concept, about the ability to be there right when somebody got out of the jail setting. And one thing I didn't mention is who staffs our Rapid Resource Center? Well, we do have a licensed clinical social worker who has lived experience himself. And I would say 90% of the individuals that staff our Rapid Resource Center are peer support specialists, community health workers that are from those agencies that you saw along the side. Many of them providing services at no additional cost to our agency. Here's the renderings of what the uh, Rapid Resource Center at the new Fisher Road Jail will look like. Again, the use of the murals, there'll be wood touches, they'll see a wood, um, you can see a wood uh, roof or ceiling, I'm sorry, on the side on the left, just really welcoming environment. We have a cafe, there'll be food, there'll be coffee, all those things that we know help get people in the door and maybe, just maybe stay 10 minutes longer so we can do a Medicaid application, so we can call a treatment provider and get you linked up. Next slide, please. I think that's, that's a really quick overview, overview. What I would say to all of you out there listening, if this is something you wanna do, you don't have to have these brand new fancy buildings. If you have some space, a closet even, that you could put a person behind that could provide resources as somebody's walking out the door, that's a step in the right direction. And I would encourage you to contact Chief Stobart, Major Chad Thompson, myself, my social services coordinator who oversees the Rapid Resource Center, at any point, we are so eager to share this model and hope that some of you out there will consider um, adding a, a similar program yourselves. And with that, I say th thank you for inviting us and sharing our program. Thank you so much. Uh, that is, I've learned even more this time, even than when I went through the jail the first time. It was a, a very informative, and I'm a big, big fan of the Rapid Resource Center. In fact, we've put an infographic together on it, and we're going to be featuring it in one of our next newsletters uh, so that people can have those details in their hand uh, about what's going on. So thank you so much for our presenters. Uh, we do have a little time for questioning. If there's, I don't see anything in the chat room, but if anyone has a question that they wanna put in the chat, we'll see if we can uh, answer it. Um, I wanted to just uh, ask the chief, what, what do you think happened to you personally in this journey? Because I know you've talked about, you would have never done this touchy feely stuff and now you, are doing some of these unique things. What changed your mind, sir? Uh, I truly, I think, you know, having the, the, being blessed to have the opportunity to, from the NIC, the, the help from the NIC to allow us to travel the country um, and see jails around the country to see how other folks were doing things. Um, you have to remember that, you know, when I took over as chief of corrections, you know, I'd worked for Franklin County and the Franklin County Sheriff's Office my entire career. So all I know is what, all I knew at the time was what I had seen. Um, I had been in very few other jails. Um, so, so to get the opportunity to, to travel and to see what other folks are doing, and, and quite frankly, just, I, I got smarter. <laughs> I, I grew up, uh, I got more educated on, on these topics, especially uh, walking through the process of the stepping up initiative and, and the dealing with the folks that are cycling through the doors of our jail with mental illness and, and learning about all of those types of things, the trainings that we had that were as a result of the stepping up initiative that were recommended, the, the CIT training, the Mental Health 101 training uh, that, that we had gotten kind of throughout this process. And then, you know, as we started to really get a handle on kind of the mental health side of the game is when the opioid epidemic kind of hit. And then getting very involved in uh, not only educating myself, but our staff on 
you know, what those folks who were cycling through the doors of our jail that were dealing with opioid withdrawal, opioid issues, um, learning about medication assisted treatment and how those are the best practices and, and really being involved and being educated and being, uh, you know, a, li a lifelong learner <laughs> instead of just staying stagnant. You know, again, Major Thompson talked about repetition does not establish validity. That that was the you know, really our mantra through this process um, is if we were going to challenge every single thing that we were doing in our current facilities, and if it didn't make sense, <laughs> um, we were going to change it. Um, you know, I've been doing this a long time. Um, what we're what we're doing in corrections warehousing folks is isn't working guys <laughs> and there's there's nowhere else in our lives that we continue to beat our heads against a wall doing the same thing if it's not working uh, one of the other things that kind of enlightened us very early in the process was having access to and um, diving into the data uh, I mean what we recognized very early was that 70, roughly 73% of the folks that cycled through the doors of our jail in any given year, we were releasing directly back into our community. And it really is in our best interest, not only as a sheriff's office, but as a community to release those folks in a little bit better shape than we found them. <laughs> um, you know, they, we talk about, you know, the the individuals that are in our jail are, are tomorrow's neighbors. These are folks that live in our community. They go to our schools. There are some of them are our friends, our family members, um, and we wanted to make sure we were treating folks in such a way that you know we would treat our friends or family members if they were coming through the, the doors of the facility and, and to give them the opportunities to get better um, and, and to give them a leg up as we release them back into the community. So I think those were probably the biggest things that, I don't know, I guess changed my mind or enlightened me on um, how we should be doing things differently than we're currently doing. Major Thompson, how, how did you find working with your staff, changing their mindset? What resistance to these new methods or this, uh, 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 touchy feely stuff. How did all this affect staff and how, what challenges did you have bringing your staff along? Well, we, uh, you know, I, there's, there's definitely uh, a lot of challenges when you try and change anything, much less almost everything uh, at once. But, you know, what, what we found uh, was that, uh, you know, more of our staff than we initially thought. Once we had to do a lot of talking and a lot of explaining and work out some hands-on uh, scenarios where they got the opportunity to experience it. Because as Chief Stobart said, you know, I, I think what really turned uh, his mind, my mind, was being able to see and experience. Um, and so the challenge was, you know, trying to get all of those staff members through this, whatever the experience was going to be. Um, but as those people started coming back, we partnered with uh, a jurisdiction that's a couple hours away and we're sending our staff to them and, and letting our staff go experience and feel direct supervision. Uh, and as those people came back, uh, they actually, I would say by and large, came back encouraged and, and wanting to uh, move forward. Uh, so uh, the challenge is there. Uh, it was finding a, a method for us to, that would speak to our people uh, and, and then trying to maintain the consistency in the message. Um, uh, is, is really another huge challenge. We're blessed that we're a full service sheriff's office. You're, there are a percentage of people who are just not gonna get on board, but unlike some other jurisdictions, 
where if you can't get on board, you probably aren't going to work here. Those people, and this is where we're blessed, those people just transferred to a different division. <laughs> they said, yeah, I'm not doing that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I would say, and the chief can speak to it, I, I would say, uh, you know, as we we're almost ready to put people in this building now, uh, people, incarcerated people, um, and our staff, I think also because we've been doing this so long, um, our staff is ready. Uh, and and we're we're really really excited. The one odd thing we saw, and I'll I'll quit talking. The one odd thing we saw, we really thought or we were going to have the most trouble out of our most experienced people. Um, and you know the younger generation, where the you know the millennials, the the go with the flow, everybody gets a chance. People, we thought they were going to be right with us, and it turned out to be the exact opposite. <laughs> Our, our older people, more experienced people are like, this is awesome. I actually had multiple people tell me, why haven't we been doing, why haven't we done this sooner? Um, but our younger, getting our younger people on board um, has really been trickier for us. Uh, so, you know, and maybe it's because they were hired into one environment and they just, they, maybe it's the change. But uh, so bringing those younger people around uh, has has been a little trickier for us, but we're we're getting there. Thank you. I think we're at the end of our hour, or hour and fifteen minutes. I wanted to give a special thanks to Chief Stobart and Major Thompson and Melissa Pearson, all of whom I've worked for for a long, long time with as great partners. Uh, thank you for taking the time to put this program together because I know you're in the midst of trying to open the new jail, and life has been very crazy and very swamped. And I know, Chief, you all living between different offices trying to move. So we do appreciate you took the time. And then again to the CCOE and to Ashley for helping us put all the events together. We will, it is taped. We will be posting it. We will be sending it out and hopefully share anyone that's on this uh, 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 video or the Zoom. If you want to share it with others, please send it on. This is all done free. Uh, we do have a a grant from the uh, Attorney General's office that has helped us with some of this and CCOE has contributed for funding some of the technical aspects. So we appreciate that, but we don't charge for these services. All, everyone that does this volunteers to help and assist us. And so we're very thankful and we hope that you all go forward and have a wonderful, happy holidays. Thank you.